Okay. Um, welcome everybody to the polymer physical chemistry one. That means there's not going to be just one, there's a total of three, right? So we're going to teach it with uh, other two professors and you will get to know them next year. And they have two uh, additional parts and we co-teach the polymer physical chemistry. So um, before we actually jump into the details, so um, I'm wondering if everybody has a little bit of chance to read the syllabus. So how about the uh, Erdic side? Have you guys got the syllabus on Canvas or it's not accessible? Uh, let me look. I looked earlier today and it was not there. Okay, if you still cannot get it, let me know. And the other thing I can help you guys is um, send an email as well to three of you. That sounds also reasonable, can be done, okay? All right, so. So I'll just uh, read a little bit the, the syllabus so everybody is going to be on the same page, okay? So I'm, my name is Xiaodan. I, I teach polymer chemistry. You can call me Xiaodan or Danny, either way would be fine. Um, I sit on the third floor, very close to the bullpen, so you wouldn't miss me. I can actually hear all the laughs going on, but I just <laughs> miss all the good jokes. Um, so office hour, that is uh, Monday afternoon or by appointment, by email, because I never had a problem with that. To be very honest, I didn't see so much students as interested to discuss. Maybe last year I had 10 to 15 appointments altogether by everybody. So that should not be a problem. You can walk in on Monday afternoon anytime, OK? And uh, in terms of the, the early XI, we can either do a Skype meeting or anything like that. If you guys need help to have more personal time, just uh, send me an email, we can, we can discuss, okay? Um, so something important is uh, the class time. They used to have three times a, a, uh, a week. Have everybody heard about that? Did somebody complain before me already? Yep. Okay, good. I do feel like having a one class for one and a half hour is quite a stretch. So I'm trying to keep everything concise and straight and try to finish about one hour. Then I'll have a break. If anybody needs some questions, we can use the next uh, 15 minutes or so to address some questions. Yeah. And last year, we did actually pretty much um, ahead of schedule according to this new schedule because it actually has more teaching time if you convert either way, right? So in, in terms of course, so this class has two textbooks I would recommend. This polymer chemistry, how many of you already have it? Okay, looks like most of you guys, right? So this is, um, although it says chemistry, but I also <laughs> have a good bit of polymer physics or fundamental aspect of polymer physics written in this book, uh, written by uh, Heinz and Lodge. They are both are well-known, well-established professors in the field. So I really like this book. Very easy to read and very simple to follow. So I think for the chemistry, they probably will use similar textbooks, so it's better for you just to get a copy of it, okay? And if you are brave enough or you feel this is putting on strains on your understanding polymer physics, this is a textbook you would go for if you want to upgrade. Polymer physics, uh, taught by, uh, um, written by Michael Rubinstein. He's a professor at the University of Northern Carolina. And uh, Ralph Kobe, he is at uh, Penn State, okay? So this is much more in-depth, more sophisticated. And I love this book just to give in the depth and you will learn more about this. And it's about, so the same chapter is about 50% or 60% more, more content. So whenever you read this, I'm sure you will learn more on this textbook. But the, if you are not comfortable with equations, etc. Start with that book. That would be easy, okay? 
And feel free to ask me if you need to borrow the book to take a look of it. Not a problem for me, as long as you return back to me. Uh, so, regarding the textbook, as I mentioned, polymer physics is a very broad field. I wish I could teach you all, but it requires me to teach three courses per year. So we actually chop it in three ways. And the way we chop it is a little bit arbitrary. I don't know his, how why historically they did this, but I'm going to teach chapter, I'm going to read it out for you, 6, um, 7, and Psalm chapter 10. 6, 7, and Psalm the chapter 10. Okay, for the chapter 8 and 9, it was taught by um, Professor Young Simon. And for the chapter 12 and 13, we'll talk by Dr. Sagin Azrinko next year, okay? So, with that being said, my goal of teaching this class is mostly fo focused on the very fundamentals of introduction what the quantum physics is. So, let's read the chapter 6 title. It's called quantum confirmation. What do you think about quantum confirmation is? Anybody, any volunteer? How polymer chains are arranged in, yeah. in groups. In, in, in right. three-dimensional way or groups. That's, that's pretty much the whole chapter I'm going to talk about, is introduce you guys the concept of polymer chain. What the polymer chain is in a real, in a imaginary space and the in a real space, OK? So the, that whole chapter, we're going to teach about a month. So the whole September, we're going to be talking about chain confirmation, how the chain oriented in three-dimensional way. In a simplest case, you can think about polymer chain just uh, like, a, like a cable, for example, here, which is connected like molecular, right? So it's very important that how they connect and how they orient in three-dimensional way. I always like to uh, discuss or put the scope about the pasta. And when you buy a bag of pasta, it's basically all the chain are oriented in one direction. Imagine that way. And it gives an isotropy and superior mechanical problem in one way, not the other. And people learn wisdom from that and use that to teach many other materials to generate better mechanical property, etc. Okay? And we will also learn a question such as how big the molecular is. When we talk about polymer and polystyrene, how big um, physically they are. What we saw in real space is usually an aggregated phase of the polymeric material. So you never see what is the single chain. Again, think about the pasta case where you pull a, a pasta out. There will be the case when you draw one single chain out, how big and how they arrange, okay? So chapter six, all about just a very simple confirmation aspect. Chapter seven will be something totally different. Chapter seven will be talking about polymer solution, polymer blend. Well, this is another important area in polymer physics because if I pick any plastics in this room, I can assure you it's not a single phase. By, by saying single phase, it means it's just a one component. It's pure polystyrene or pure polyacetylene. Uh, for example, this again, this is likely to be a PVC, you know, wrapping of your cable. PVC provides insulating property as well as some of the mechanical properties help it. But to make it look pretty or be flexible or be sustainable for long term, you actually need a lot of component in it. If you work in a chemical company, I know some of them like Toby, probably. You worked in the Eastman Coda before came here, right? Yep. They have formulation scientists. They do one thing is play with different formulation to formulate a good polymer, okay? That will require, you know, not only just one metric, but multiple metrics to be co-optimized to meet the customer need. So the chapter about polymer solution or polymer blends is discussing about fundamentals 
how do we understand if we put two materials together, how they would behave? Especially if you mix oil and water together, you know, they, they tend to phase separate. So you will hear the term phase separate many times in, the, in that chapter. And we will study the case why some material mix, some material don't mix. And how can we camp a theory to des describe that? What kind of the, the, the science we can get out of it? So a lot of work basically being developed in the early 50s, 60s is by um, Professor Paul Flory. He's a very famous person. And he developed the sound a very fundamental you know, solution theory to predict how much entropy you would uh, generate, how much enthalpy you would uh, loss when you mix in things. And using that very simple theory, people still use these days, you can basically predict if mixed polystyrene polyethylene, will they mix or not? Quite amazing, right? So we're going to study, spend another month in there just to, to study that aspect of uh, about blending, mixing. And the last part of a uh, lecture that I'm going to teach is rubber elasticity. Okay, we will touch upon the uh, topic why rubbers are unique class of polymer, because most of polymer either they use the structure material, which is rigid. In many cases, you know, like a cap in the water bottle is used as structural material. They provide a certain structure and mechanical property, but not mu much elasticity, right? There's also material used for insulating property. But rubber is a so unique material that none of the other material actually has similar property, especially for inorganics. I like to make jokes about inorganics because I think polymers is always better than inorganics, okay? In that regard, you know, rubber has the ability to deform and when you release the force, it will come back. And some of you might argue there's also inorganic like a spring, but they behave totally differently. And then my goal is to educate you what's the difference between the a metal spring versus a rubber elasticity. And by the end of that chapter, that we will learn why rubbers are elastic. Okay? So there's also quite a lot of equations coming to play and people, how people develop the fundamentals about the rubbers actually works. And amazingly, using the chain conformation, which is chapter six, we can pretty much understand why rubber elasticity is. And in many cases, well, you can even predict if you pull a chain, how much elastic force you would have in a rubbery material in an ideal case. Okay? So those three chapters are going to be my goal to help you guys to, to understand the polymer physics about chain conformation, solution property, and the rubber elasticity. That will be chapter uh, 6, 7, and 10. All right. OK, let's jump into the important part, because this is like five pages, but important thing is just a few key things, right? I talk about what we're going to teach. And roughly, the timeline is we will try to cover one chapter uh, per month. So September, October, and November, each month we will cover one chapter, okay? And I think one, one key thing everybody need to know is how I evaluate the course and how, how I get the feedbacks from students. So we will have homeworks, and that's composed about 35% of the final evaluation, okay? We will also have quizzes. Oh, the f okay, that's what you guys are talking about. It will mm -hmm. disconnect. Where did the remote go? Oh, in the back. So, should I just press it again? Welcome to a Cisco meeting. You are entering the meeting now. 
It's a good reminder to me, actually. If I make three breaks, it's about one hour, <laughs> right? So I cannot teach more than three breaks. <laughs> okay, so cost evaluation. Did they declare that homeworks will be something important? And I will also have some quizzes as well as exam. And, um, you know, um, exams will be about three, each one for one chapter. Then at the end of it, we will have a one final exam, okay? Quite, quite common for, for class. Okay, all the details, I believe you guys have been educated uh, many times in your previous class. It's important to have a good uh, academic honesty, no pressure, and so don't copy from the other students for the homework. Okay, so let me see. That's pretty much it. I think that's all I have in terms of introduction of the class and the scope of the class. Any question from the students about how we, what are we going to cover in the class, what the roughly the schedule is, and how I evaluate the class? Anyone? Any question? Now is a good time. Lena? Yeah. Our first test is scheduled on September 23rd. I believe that's a Monday where we wouldn't be meeting. Oh, I see. I see. So let me explain. The, that is just to say it will happen that week, not exactly oh. on that day. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I do not intend to put that exactly day, but trying to have the, give the, rem, remind me again what's happening during these. So there are going to be a full break. Everybody knows that? That's a good time for you to, you know, take a vacation. So book a ticket early, because no class. And that's the best thing about the first year is no professors, is, you know, your mentor. You pretty much can do anything. And Thanksgiving week is on the week of uh, November 25th, okay? We wouldn't have a class uh, on that week as well. Okay, any question for the schedule? All right. Straight, easy, right? Okay, yes, please. Uh, well, it's really more of a statement. Uh, on Canvas, I think the reason we can't see the uh, any because we're in a technically a different section on Canvas. Oh, I so had the same so confusion so as well. I had the same confusion as well because I saw there's two parallel sections says 710. Okay, I see. That's likely the reason. Um, okay, I would, uh, I would do following. I would try to talk to the university, see if they can combine them into one. That would be ideal, then I don't need to duplicate things. But meantime, I'll upload, uh, for now, I will upload it to both sides, so you can have a copy of there as well. And I will do actually today after class and um, tomorrow, if you guys haven't seen it, just uh, send me an email, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Also on our end, Professor Gu, it yeah. looks like the, the course isn't published on Canvas. Yeah. So like it shows up that it's there, but we can't actually find any of the files or anything. All right, good, good, good to know. I'll get that addressed as well. So tomorrow I'll follow up with everybody to make sure. So we talked about the big picture of the class, we talked about what we need to discuss. I think the next thing that I want to do is um, take it easy, just to want to know everybody a little bit. And maybe everybody can help me, tell me a bit about your background, where your name and where you did your degree before, and uh, what is your, um, uh, how can I put it this way? What is your degree? And uh, th one more question is how comfortable with mathematics? Because this will be a reoccurring uh, theme for the class as we have uh, quite a lot of equations, especially the concept about vectors and scalars, etc. Okay? So, yeah, how about we start from front, then go back in the forest, and finally wind to the Erdic? Would that be okay? Okay. 
stand up there? Yeah, you can start. Then we go, go this way. Um, Kevin yeah. Green, I graduated from Ole Miss with chemical engineering. Uh huh. Pretty comfortable with math. Okay. Well, excellent. Nice meeting. Toby Edwards. Um, uh -huh. I went to Emory Engineering College. Um, uh huh. Degree in chemistry. I've okay. Been at Eastman Chemical for the last three years and mildly comfortable with math. Oh, welcome back to the school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm an undergrad from IIT Delhi, I'm uh -huh. from India. Uh -huh. uh, I, after that, I worked in an academic lab for a few years. I okay. Was on Yeah. Um, I'm an engineer, so I did, but I did math in different schools, so it's mildly comfortable. Okay. That's great. Uh, my name is William Guzman. I went to university, or mm. Texas A&M University. Uh -huh. I got my degree in chemistry. Okay. Uh, and then I worked for the past four years for Konica U.S. Materials. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. But I good. took up to DPQ there. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. So very good to know. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sonia Shantu. Yeah. I actually only became a chemistry major during my junior year because I was anthropology. So I only got a chance to take Calc 1 and two semesters okay. of physics. But I really liked those classes. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Mark Robertson. I got my degree in chemical engineering from Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty comfortable with math. Okay. We had a lot of uh, chemistry and chemical engineer. Yeah. It's about to stop. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Lena Ganberry, and yeah. I got my degree in plastics and composites engineering from Western Washington University. Uh huh. Um, and for that degree, we only had to take math up to Calc two. So okay. Differential okay. I see. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I'm yeah. Levi Hammernick. I also got a degree in plastics and composites from Western Washington University. So okay. I'm Okay. Some calc, but no okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Kim Jong Wong. I, I was a uh, master of polymer science degree from the University of Akron. And I, I feel I'm okay with polymer physics. Okay. Okay. Uh, Welcome. My, my name is Jin Fei Wong. Uh, I got my uh, master degree in Nanjing University and major in the polymer chemistry and physics. Uh, maybe uh, I take the Mm -hmm. My name is Zhu Qing Liu, mm -hmm. and I got my master's degree from chemistry from uh, National Johnson University from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I feel comfortable with polymer physics and math. Okay, good. Uh, so. Please, yes. I am Mustafa Abdelo, I'm from yeah. Egypt. Uh -huh. I got my master's degree, my master's degree from Alexander University mm -hmm. in uh -huh. chemistry. Yeah. I feel I'm okay with math. Okay. Calculations, equations. Great. Okay. I'm Alex Fortenberry. I graduated from Ole Miss with a master's in chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I am somewhat comfortable with math. Okay. Good. I heard like at least two? Three. three. three? One, two, three. Good. I'm Sam Hunt. I have a degree in mathematics and chemistry from St. Albert College, so I'm close. Okay. Okay, good. So I know we have three more in the, in the background. Can you, can you also have uh, interact with everybody, do a short introduction? Okay. I'll, I'll stay in Wentworth, uh, uh -huh. bachelor's from USM, Paul right. Science. Right. Um, and I've had to count three, so maybe need to brush up on some more physics concepts. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you have you graduated from USM, so you should have learned class at least once, right? With yeah. uh, you know bachelor degree. At least once. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, my name is John Brazier. I graduated in 2012 with a degree in chemical engineering from Ole Miss. Okay. Uh, the past seven or so years, I've worked in the private sector with polyurethane and petroleum refining. Mm -hmm. Recently joined the team here at the Corps of Engineers. Okay. Go pretty couple with math. Great. Um, I'm Sarah Grace Setterholm. I graduated with a degree in chemistry from Mississippi College in 2018. Um, and I pretty much crammed as many math classes in as I could. So okay. it, it, I like math. It's good. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
So good, it looks like we have actually a very broad background. Not only have, uh, I heard several times, we have good chemistry degree. I sure I will, um, you guys should be very comfortable with the other um, polymer chemistry class. Yeah, We have several of them, uh, chemical engineering, two of them plastic engineer. Um, chemical engineer is quite a, quite a feel, right? So that's a good plan. I feel quite comfortable, much better than uh, last year. We had more majority of chemistry, so I actually need to make some real adjustment in the course what I teach. Okay, so good. Uh, so um, with the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I, I'm just going to have a, a, just a, a brief introduction about what's uh, what the first chapter give you a preview of the whole season, sort of, okay? So, you guys can take a note or not. It's just a short introduction, five minutes or so. So, this is particularly give you some ideas how, how big the polymer we actually are dealing with. So, I want everybody to start to picture a very simple case of polymer chain. Think about a polyethylene. It's uh, very commonly used almost everywhere in the plastic bag. Probably one of the major problems um, for the plastic recycling community, because we use so of them, we use polyolefin, right? And it's hard to recycle these and put them back to use. But they are so useful. Meantime, I want you guys to think about that case and think about a linear chain. If, if you think about the linear chain, I want to give you guys some concept. What if we have 180K polyethylene? So how would you picture the chain in real life? I know we are not a microscope. We cannot see it directly. But let's say we're uh, Ant-Man or someone that like, can be zooming really small. You can see this. How would you picture a polymer chain? That actually will be taught about extensively in the first chapter. How would you envision the polymer chain will look like? Or if, if I need to pick up this thing up, if you have a super microscope, you can zoom in a thousand time. You can see like tiny voids, etc. You zoom in another thousand time. You reach micron level, then you start to see some of the phases between additive, etc. You zoom it by another factor of thousand, you reach nanometer. Now we are talking about you're reaching the chain level. Okay, you, you can start to actually see how three-dimensionally it's actually being packed. Anybody can help me here? How would you think a chain in a typical plastic would behave? Would they behave like I talk about spaghetti or would they behave like very oriented or semi-oriented or very random? Like a spaghetti, like random. Random. Great. That's typically the case. And uh, in the class, we will explain why random is preferred. There's actually a reason behind that for a given chain. If you don't give it extra force, it will prefer to adopt a random shape. And people actually give it a turn called a Gaussian coil. It's actually a coil shape. So illustratively, you can just uh, draw. Random chain, not pretty much random, like this. And if you zoom in here even more, you will have a repeating unit for the polyethylene, right? So the question is, how big these chains are? I want to ask two questions. First is, what the size of this coil potentially can be? What if we draw, think about I and the, one of the nano men. I pull it here. I have another student who is brave enough to become second nano man. Pull the other end. We now made one perfect 
linear chain, how big they will be. Good. Welcome to a Cisco meeting. You are entering the meeting now. Hopefully they can fix the bug. Okay. We're back. Okay, great. Good reminder for me. So, anybody? Anyone? Yeah. So one by one. So the one says really wrong. That's pretty true. <laughs> and these will be the case. As you, if you even pull a string on the on the floor like this cable, you will see it will be many orders of difference. And how big roughly in terms of nanometer or microns or could it be angstroms? How big the size if we talk about this range, molecular weight range? Because that's a commonly used molecular weight, actually, a lot of engineer plastic. We're talking about hundreds or thousands of kilo Dalton. And, and come back. Doing your approximation, so it's one repeat unit is one centimeter long. Yes. But the chain would be two miles long. Would it be two miles long? How do you get the number? 280K. 280K. Let's, let's do a little bit of math just to lay a little bit knowledge about how everybody should envision the chain in terms of real space. And in, in, a, in a size scale that everybody can live if we zoom in. So let's first dive into this space. So question one is, anybody know how big is the carbon-carbon bond? The distance between that, roughly? Three, I heard three Enstron. 1.1 Enstrons. Anyone think it's nanometer size scale? I okay. Uh huh. <laughs> it's okay. Enstron is, like, um, yeah. Enstron is 110, 10 to the minus 10 meter. This is 10 to the minus 9. So this is the 10 times, 10 Enstron is 1 nanometer. This is a 10 to the minus 6, and you would have, uh, let's say, millimeter. That's 10 to the minus 3. OK? So this is a roughly, I think everybody got the dimension right, about 1.5. OK? So that's the size scale for a carbon carbon bond. Instrument is very hard to reach for many characterization techniques. I wouldn't teach you about that, but next spring, you guys will learn the morphology characterization lab given by likely Professor Rollins, and they will teach about what kind of technique you can look at tiny, sp tiny scale features, okay? So how much then per each repeating unit we have? Because we have two carbon bonds. Let's just uh, keep it simple, saying it's going to be always straight. So one repeating units, now we have three Enstrom, right? Because two times 1.5 is about three. And how much re uh, repeating units we have? We have divide by monomer. You can see I didn't write this number randomly, so that they can count down to be 10,000 is the repeating unit, right? For the size scale, we talk about 280K polyethylene. So if you pull everything really straight, this is about the size, the whole length. Let's write the length is about 10,000 multiplied by 3 Enstrom per repeating unit. You will reach. It's okay. You said divided by 28? Yes. What does the 28 represent? 28 is the uh, molecular weight for uh, each repeating unit. Oh. So carbon is 12 Got in the atomic number, hydrogen is 1. So for each repeating unit, you would have a molecular weight about 28. So now if you if envision how big these molecular, if you pull it all straight, this is about 3 micron meter. Right? 
And by the end of the class, we will also study how big the core size is. And that's a little bit trickier to characterize because we need a physical term to define how big that is. Right? Anybody can have some clue how you would uh, able to understand a chain is in core state and how likely this will be. We know in the fully straight case, it will be 3 micron. How about this in the coil state? Can we have a size to describe how big your coil is? The question is how big that will be if you're in the coil state. I heard it. I heard some answer. Can you repeat it again? The light scattering to determine end in distance. Somebody already gave a very good answer. That's right. So we we actually do not use a microscope to direct the measure. So you wouldn't have somebody sort of an iron man put a ruler because that's commonly people do measure how big it is. We use some technical scattering. That would be measure something called statical end-to-end -end distance that measures roughly the average distance between two ends. And I wouldn't give you the equations because we're going to talk about in the next months just to understand how actually we statistically reach that value. But I can give you a, a sneak peek about the, the final value of that. It's actually about roughly about 5 nanometer. And we will spend the whole month just to figure out how to get it there. If you already know, just keep quiet, OK? Don't give the spoiler yet. But in real space, this is nanospace. This is a factor of almost a three orders of magnitude difference. So how do you put it in a real space perspective? Let's say if this is about five centimeter, five centimeter, this would be about 300 meters, right? So this is about, if you think about this as a tennis ball, if you draw the chain fully straight, it will be roughly the size of a football court. It's a huge difference how much polymer can comes in and being stretched. There's a lot of dimensionality change in here. So, it's quite amazing, right? So now think about how you process your polymer, or how you how you actually print your material, or pull your material, or torches, whatever way you like. It will have different configuration in three-dimensional space. And this is how they orient or be impacted in three-dimensional is very critical to a lot of property. And the property we can broadly speak about, it can be mechanical property. We know oriented the polymers shows much stronger mechanical property in the oriented direction. That's one either way is you can envision how chain conformation is important. The other way is electrical property. If you think about there's preference charge transport along one, you know, along the polymer chain direction. If you pull everything straight, you know, you create a, a charge transport highway, you can reach to your destination much faster, right? It's a straight line. Or you can think about optical property. There's ways if you create orientation in your molecular, you cause um, a polarization effect in your material. All these come into play when you think about conformation and chain dimension. Additionally, it will be important in the later on in the, in the chapter 10 when we talk about chain conformation is also related to elasticity. So we will touch that base later on. So 
I'm gonna stop here. So this is a give you some taste of what the next month will be look like. We will talk about chain confirmation in more detail. We will explain you the model, how you can get the different sizes from the polymer chain. And with those knowledge, we should be able to easily understand if somebody tell you I have polystyrene, I have a 10K, and you, you should have a, some sort of physical image or idea how they would behave in solvent, okay? So with that, I'd like to wrap up today's lecture. So we're going to meet again next uh, Tuesday. And in the next class, we will, we will follow the textbook, um, start first uh, two, three chapters, and we will start talking about the lectures. So the, um, what I already did is upload the PowerPoint to the Canvas, but I will do publish, and uh, everybody can have a copy of that. So please take a look, and if you have some time, OK? And please also read the chapters before we teach it. So roughly the pace would be one class, we finish one chapter. And we will go through the chap uh, one class, finish one sub-chapter. So not one chapter. In, the, in each chapter, there is a four or five sub-chapter. <laughs> then everybody would get a degree in engineer within one month. That would be amazing, <laughs> right? OK, so. With that, I will wrap up. Any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we will see each other on next uh, Tuesday, OK? OK, the Erdic team, bye for now.